Uh, welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine Molecular Medicine podcast and we're here in sunny Philadelphia and uh, we're at the Society of Nuclear Medicine meeting and uh, I've got some great news uh, we've uh, we're talking to uh, Dr uh, Hoffman who's from the Peter McCallum Institute in Melbourne um, and uh, you've got the image of the year Yes, it's a great honour. <laughs> it's a great honour, and it's the premier award, really, awarded every year at the Society of Nuclear Medicine, and it shows excellence in nuclear medicine. Perhaps you could start by telling us a little bit about yourself and a bit about where you work. So I'm a nuclear medicine physician at Peter McCullum Cancer Centre in Melbourne. Uh, this is a big hospital dedicated to uh, treatment of cancer, and uh, we've got a very large nuclear medicine department, with uh, four PET CT cameras, two SPECT CT cameras, uh, radio pharmacy, uh, there's a cyclotron and a preclinical imaging facility, and there's a lot of hardcore oncology research that occurs elsewhere around the hospital. Right. Uh, so really, it's uh, half the floor space of the hospital is actually basic science research laboratories, and the other half is uh, clinical care. Right, right. And and um, Peter Mack has long been at the uh, the front line of uh, of cancer research. Um, so uh, perhaps you could perhaps give us a little bit of background to this image. Uh, what's it about? Uh, what's the sort of trial that it's related to? Sure. Uh, so the trial was exploring PSMA theranostics. Yes. Uh, so using uh, radio labelled small molecules. Yes. Uh, labelled to small peptide-like substances yep. that bind to prostate-specific membrane antigen, PSMA, right. which is a receptor that's overexpressed on the surface of prostate cancer cells. And uh, it's upregulated in the castrate-resistant metastatic disease, uh, so analogous to using radioiodine for treating thyroid cancer. Uh, in this case, we're using lutetium at PSMA for treating prostate cancer and right. we're getting some remarkable results. And prostate cancer is one of the um, most important cancers in the world, isn't it? It's uh, very prevalent yep. in men and a big cause of uh, morbidity uh, and mortality. Right. And there's not a lot of effective treatment options for that very advanced disease when it's spread uh, particularly to the bones and to to organs. Right. And and the current levels of treatments don't work particularly well once them once it's spread, do they? Yeah, correct. The survival's in the order of sort of even less than a year once you've failed chemotherapy and second line hormone therapy. Right. So these men do very badly and often have a lot of pain from the metastases and really suffer a lot. Now the reason why this is an image of the year, not a therapy of the year, is that it's a theranostic. So there's an image and a therapy, right? Correct. So the image of the air is a gallium-68 uh, PSMA PET scan, right. or a series of them in eight people yes. out of a prospective study of 50 men. Right. And these, uh, these were the sort of best eight responders uh, in, the, in the trial, and uh, we highlighted the disease using an SUV threshold, an automated threshold to say anything above three is prostate cancer. Right. And then we excluded the physiologic uptake, yep. which is in the salivary glands and the, and the kidneys mainly. So we get some really nice images with the tumour being very clear uh, before therapy and uh, after therapy. And the therapy really uses uh, a very similar uh, tracer to what, what you do to take the image with. You just give a, a, a radioactive component that goes in and radiates the tumour, correct? Correct. So the uh, PET scan is done with gallium-68, yep. or it can be done with fluorine-18 as well, which are positron emitters. Yes. So these pass out of the body and the PET scan produces these beautiful 3D pictures. And for the therapy, we use really a very similar molecule. It's not identical, but it could be identical. Yeah. And we label it with lutetium-177, which is a beta emitter. Uh, similar characteristics, actually, to radioactive iodine, which has been used for therapy for, right. for over 75 years. So by doing the imaging virtually with the same uh, molecule, it means that you're treating what you see and you see what you treat. Correct. That's the marvellous thing about <laughs> theranostics is there's no magic to it. We don't treat everyone. Right. We do the PSMA PET scan, and if the tumours aren't lighting up brightly, meaning they don't have high PSMA expression, then we don't treat those patients. Right. But that's good for the patients, even though it means that option's not available to them. At least they don't have another futile therapy and right. have to come to hospital for treatments uh, and endure side effects right. uh, w w when it's not likely to work. 
Right. And you can see the extent of it working. I mean, the image does show that, doesn't it? Yes, yes. So it's kind of in pretty intuitive images, both for the patient and, and the doctors. Right. And the, the images showed really extensive disease. I mean, metastases everywhere yeah. throughout the body in a lot of these images. Yes. And then afterwards, gone. Yeah, which or... is quite incredible for a... Uh, <laughs> These patients had really failed all conventional lines of therapies, often three, four lines of therapy, and they were quite unwell with yeah. pain and fatigue. And then after the treatment, their quality of life uh, improved a lot in right. line with what you see on the images. Right. And in line with this image, I mean, there's been, uh, out of Melbourne or out of Australia, really, there's been multi-centre trials showing this on a wide scale and showing the benefit of this, um, and that's been widely published, hasn't it? Uh, so this was a phase two prospective study right and uh, really what's differed by what we've done at Peter Mac is uh, the therapy was pioneered in Germany yes and they treated hundreds of patients yes but they did it as a compassionate access right and which benefited these patients a lot uh, but it wasn't done in a rigorous manner right uh, so the precise side effect profile and precise response rates were difficult to tease out right. and here we did 50 patients in an oncologic style prospective study so we've got very clean results yep. uh, and that study has now led to a large Australian randomised trial that's up and running. Right and the importance of doing trials this way is because if we want to get these treatments funded and reimbursed right. uh, having anecdotes uh, doesn't please the government or no. funding authorities or even our oncology colleagues don't believe the data right. so unless we do it rigorously uh, it's very difficult even to get highly effective therapies available. Right, and certainly to get government funding, but in the US to get insurance company funding, correct? Absolutely, and uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in this area now because the results are quite spectacular. Uh, we, it's worth mentioning that we're very lucky in Australia to have ANSTO, right. the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, that make Lutetium-177 right in Australia near right. Lucas Heights and there's only several manufacturers of lutetium around the world and one of them uh, is in Australia. Right. So that's uh, what's enabled this study. In fact, Ansto provided the lutetium at no cost right. uh, for this study, which really enabled it to happen. Otherwise, it would have and been Anstow, very difficult for um, us to do this. Ansto operates with government support, right? It's really a government, you know, it's taxpayer funded yes. uh, organisation. Uh, so we're very grateful for them. Yes. And the other component is the PSMA 617, which is the small molecule, and that's that, that was supplied for free from ABX, which is essentially a German chemi chemical manufacturer right. that makes chemical components for nuclear medicine. Right. And they provided us with the PSMA 617, and uh, we make it on site. We get the lutetium from Ansto, the PSMA 617 from Germany, and our radiopharmacist cooks it uh, in our on-site radio pharmacy and then it's given to a patient. Right. So that's quite unique as well compared to other drugs that come pre-made right. in a box. Well, you can't get it pre-made because it's a radioactive compound so it decays away. If they made it in a box in Germany, by the time it got here, it would be gone, right? Well, lutetium, interesting, it does have a seven-day half-life. Right. So it sticks, it, it decays relatively slowly. So it is possible to manufacture it centrally yeah. and ship it around the world. Right. Uh, you know, radium is shipped from other parts of the world and uh, so it is, it is theoretically possible. possible and as this becomes more industrialised yeah. it is probably likely that it will be shipped uh, ready to inject into a patient. Right. Where next? Where next? So now we've started a trial called the Therapy Study. Yeah. Bit of an ac which stands for Theranostic PSMA. Yes. And it's a uh, study which has a, a randomised study. Yeah. And we're randomising 200 people yeah. around Australia to lutetium PSMA or chemotherapy. And the right. chemotherapy is cabazitaxel, which is a second-line chemotherapy for prostate cancer. And we've got this up and running at 10 sites around Australia. Uh, Peter Max is sort of the lead site. Right. And uh, that started probably three months ago. Right. And we've already randomised uh, over 25 patients. Right. And it's taken probably 12 to 18 months to get this trial up and running. And there's a lot of support from a number of uh, different philanthropic organisations and government support and industry support. 
that has uh, enabled this trial to happen. Right. And if you show that that works, there's a, there's a whole lot of benefits. Not only is it, you're going to have a better outcome for patients, but the traditional chemotherapies often have side effects, don't they? They're correct. So we'll be looking at the quality of life difference between the two arms. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you've got a lot of disease, chemotherapy can actually improve your symptoms. Right. Uh, but if you're not responding, it can also have a lot of toxicity. Right. So we anticipate that the rotation PSMA will be much better tolerated, right. but also probably have better response rates. Right. But we have to show that, and, right. uh, and we need to produce the data. So the people that were in the, this existing study had uh, people who hadn't succeeded with traditional treatments, right? They had fake, progressed after traditional right. treatments, so we've brought it one step earlier. Right. Now it's in a, you know, a comparator against uh, chemotherapy. Right. So we're bringing these treatments earlier and earlier in yes. the disease process. So seeing they work well, do you think it's possible that by bringing back as almost a first-line treatment, you may actually have a better outcome? Absolutely. Right. So I think if we look back at the, the history of nuclear medicine, we use radioactive iodine as a first-line treatment for yeah. patients with thyroid cancer, yeah. and it works quite well. You yeah. can cure patients with metastatic disease yeah. with uh, radioactive iodine. Yeah. It's probably the first targeted therapy in, in oncology, and uh, it may well be that this therapy is also best given first line. Right. Uh, but it's, uh, it takes time to get there. When right. there's a, You've got to do it in stages. When there's established therapies... Uh, you've got to prove your benefit. You've got to prove your benefit against later lines of therapy first and bring it back in a, in a stepwise manner. Right. But if you do that, you're also going to save costs, aren't you? Because these other therapies mean that people get sick, they're expensive, they yes. take long. If you can just give a, a shot of radioactive material and it's fixed then not only is everyone going to survive better, but it's going to save the governments who are paying for these things money. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of modern targeted therapies in oncology have to take every day a tablet, and uh, that's expensive, whereas right. here we're giving a few cycles of therapy and then we pause and stop, and that's, that may be very cost-effective. Right. Well, that's exciting to see that. Do you think there's going to be other therapies for other cancers that, that, that are along a similar line? Uh, well, yeah, well, I think we already have them. So this, all of this prostate work actually evolved from our big program that we have in treating neuroendocrine tumours with, right. with lutetium dotatate. And, yeah. uh, you know, that was a, a program established in Peter Mac by, by Rod Hicks yes. some time ago, as early as probably 20 years ago. And we've been using lutetium for, I think, 12 years right. at Peter Mac. And that experience both in selecting patients, the radiochemistry, the radiolabeling, how to handle lutetium, uh, what to expect, really enabled us to get into the prostate cancer therapy very early. Right. And uh, I think both the neuroendocrine and the prostate cancer results are quite profound and people are looking at targets in a whole array of right. different tumours to use the same theranostic principle. Right. So neuroendocrine tumours are fairly rare tumours and prostate's fairly common, but there's other cancers that people get, like breast cancer and lung cancer and so on. Maybe there's a chance that these things might work there. Sure. Yeah. That's exciting stuff. Yes, it's a promising uh, future for nuclear medicine, I think. Yeah. And uh, we're doing probably, you know, one of the world leaders in Australia because of the... Uh, Availability and uh, access to these therapies and also the regulatory environment that enables it to happen. Right. Yeah, Australia is blessed to have these people who work together. It's not just a one-place option. You need a lot of players to make these things work, and, and, uh, and uh, that's great to Sorry. see. Uh, you're heading back to Melbourne now, and the presentation is going to be done here. What's been the highlight of the meeting uh, for you so far? Oh, look, this domain of PSMA, both on the imaging and the therapy side, there's been a lot of uh, novel uh, new science presented. Yes. Uh, there's a whole array of sort of next generation PSMA agents for imaging, yep. which uh, may improve slightly on what we have, and a lot of interesting data coming out of uh, Germany, right. uh, moving beyond lutetium to alpha therapy with actinium. Right. So there's been a lot of interesting PSMA. Uh, research presented. Yeah, it's interesting the, the combination between Germany and Australia. I, I, I've, I've got another podcast coming up where they've 
where they've done this even earlier as a first line treatment, but only in a small group of people. I think what's what's been great is that Australia's been able to organise these widespread trials and, and managed to bring that into a wider sphere. So it's a, it's a great combination to see how something in Germany works so well with something in Australia. Yes, yes. Clearly there's a collaborative partnership there that, that's uh, working very well. Right. And the other place that I think that's often done a lot of these things, particularly in neuroendocrine work, has been India, has been, uh, been one of the early adopters of this work as well. Yeah, India is an interesting country. We do get some uh, visitors that come from India to Australia to learn some of these new techniques. And what's uh, yeah, interesting about them is they often they go back to their country and they just get moving and they enable their patients to access these therapies. Uh, I think they've got a reasonably deregulated environment, whereas people from other more advanced countries come to our centre and look at these new therapies and they go back home and they go, well, you know, we can't possibly use these treatments. They're not approved. Uh, we're not going to run a clinical trial. So they're really uh, innovative in early adoption in, in India. Right. I guess Australia acts as sort of a middleman, I guess. It's the one that sort of is an early adopter, but early adopter in terms of getting FDA approvals and so on, because a lot of the drugs that have been used uh, in uh, the US now have been adopted and developed in Australia to some degree, and at least in terms of setting up early trials. Yeah, I think what we're good at in Australia is doing high quality research in yes. a very robust way, yes. uh, producing the sort of data that's needed to get regulatory approval and that's the direction we need to sort of move towards. So how could someone find out a bit more about this if they're interested? Uh, Google is a good way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's obviously a lot of literature yes. in the area. We've just published a paper very recently on the outcomes of the uh, 30 patient cohort in Lancet Oncology, yep. which is really the leading oncology journal. Yep. So that was published uh, two months ago. So that data is a uh, uh, now available. I can maybe share an interesting anecdote about that. Sure. But the uh, the uh, the S and M image of the air yeah. was actually figure two in the Lancet publication. Really. And uh, in, in its draft form. Huh. And as it progressed through the editorial process, yeah. uh, we were actually asked to remove that figure because it's an oncology journal and it was a you know it was a reasonably large trial and they want to avoid showing individual patient examples because uh -huh. in any large trial let's say you did a trial of 500 patients yeah. you would have maybe one or two spectacular responses so they see that as a little bit biased in the oncology world you're just cherry picking showing your best data right whereas in the nuclear medicine community it's the opposite <laughs> <laughs> we it's like showing our, our pictures right. uh, so the image that was removed is the uh, SNM image of the air I've uh, never heard of that before. That's amazing. Which is uh, uh, <laughs> quite interesting. Is it, uh, what do the editors of The Lancet think now? <laughs> I'm not sure, but it highlights just a different philosophy of the, uh, of the two specialties. Right. But I think uh, perhaps as nuclear medicine specialists, we understand those images in, in a way that perhaps The Lancet editors don't. Right. Uh, we understand the truth that those images were showing us, the right. extent of disease after failing really all forms of conventional therapies, being able to achieve that, that, that you know, that can't happen by magic. No. Uh, so no. Patients are serving as their own control after right. they failed all conventional therapies. So these are pretty compelling images to us and they, they tell a really nice story uh, of these quite incredible responses in, in a single image. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, a lot of this gives hope to people that, the, that, that prostate cancer may be something that we can manage more, much more effectively going into the future. Absolutely. I think we'll, we'll see a lot of these therapies uh, probably being standard of care uh, once we have some larger phase three trials done. Thanks to you, partly anyway, partly. And, uh, and, the, and the team that's, that's put us together. Thank you very much for taking part in the podcast. Pleasure. Thank you. Good.